Uh, before we start, I want to give a shout out to Keyframe and the animations that that Jimmy's going to show with his with his work and the teams is all through Keyframe. Um, use Keyframe myself from done some webinars in the past. If you want to check out their work, go on to modernsoccercoach.com slash blog and there's some Keyframe examples of me using it with different player feedbacks. But here is a Keyframe uh, little clip uh, before we start and then we'll get stuck into it. The free trial, if you're a coach who, who wants to use some animations and some of the examples that Jimmy will use, uh, Keyframe is not only the best on the market, but it's also the much, most affordable. So it's great for coaches that are that are looking to do some analysis, put some stuff out, but also coaches that are looking to do some feedback with their players. Um, and again, if you want to go on modernsoccercoach.com slash blog, there's some webinars that I've done using it. Uh, please go ahead, check it out. Definitely try the free trial. Uh, the link is on there. Okay, Jimmy. Yeah. Awesome. Great I'm to have you on. For this. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, really, really excited to have you on. Two coaches, and that's why we've we've got such a big response. This two coaches that are arguably the best in the world at the minute. Um, yeah. You know, as we get stuck into it, I suppose one by one. Um, what is it about Guardiola and uh, and Tuchel as 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 you're seeing as you study their them tactically? Uh, what stands out from each one, respectively? I think for Pep, it would have to be his versatility. Every when it, when we look back at his career, Barcelona, Bayern Munich, and now with City, he's always done something that prior you would think was crazy. So the false nine at Barca, he was known for the inverted fullback we started to see at Bayern. And now this year with City, he's kind of brought it all together. We've seen them play. Uh, without a forward and almost like a pentagon shape in midfield with Cancelo coming in as an inverted fullback and then having those three offensive midfield options and then having the movement just flow from there. And then with Tuchel, the thing that's impressed me most is his ability to come in in this Chelsea side and organize them and get them all playing in a system that he started with a few uh, ideas he wanted to implement with he wanted the captain on the field as Bill Cueta. He wanted Thiago Silva on the field and a few other key pieces and finding a system that could fit all of them, but then have the ability to progress in that system as we see players starting to grow into their roles at the team. And now we're seeing the qualities as they get more time together um, with Tuchel uh, to really then progress, progress with his system. So yeah, super excited for the final. Yeah, it should be good. Should be good. Um, right, we're going to go into some video and some some findings that you you've analysed with the teams coming up against each other. Uh, do you want to give us a little, uh, I suppose, a little preview of, of what we're going into? Yeah. So uh, leading up to this, I rewatched their last two games against each other in the FA Cup and pre and the Premier League match they played, and I thought it'd be a good place to start with the base of their structures and the build up phase um, because Tuchel. He's gone with the three two, uh, the three central defenders and the double pivot. But now with Conte coming into the role, we start to see it starting to shift a little. And with Manchester City and Pep Guardiola, oftentimes they do build up with three 
uh, central defenders, but they use more asymmetry in their movement to create this with the double pivot as well. And so I thought there was a lot of similarities, um, but also they apply it in almost completely different ways. So it was an interesting contrast um, that I thought would be worth taking a deeper look at. So brilliant, brilliant. Okay, we will waste no time. We'll get stuck into the to the analysis, uh, and then we'll come back with some more about maybe a little insight about the rotations, and then we'll take some questions as well. So this video is going to be looking at Chelsea comparing their build-up and Manchester City build-up ahead of the Champions League final. And in this video, we're going to be looking at some asymmetries, some similarities and differences within these asymmetries of each team's build-up, and primarily focusing on the first and second third of the field for both teams, and primarily looking at their first and second line of their build-up shape and looking to describe their team structure from their bases of the first and second line. So before we start, we have to acknowledge the variability within the Manchester City first and second line, whereas Chelsea, they are more set in their structure. Ever since Tuchel took over the job, they went with three central defenders and the double pivot. And now as they start to get used to the structure, start to adopt the roles and the players grow into the roles that Tuchel has put in place for them, There's, we're starting to see the qualities of the players a little bit more. For example, Conte playing as the second holding midfielder along Jorginho, he's been playing more as an eight with more license to get forward, which makes sense because of his ability to cover ground and his athletic qualities puts him closer, higher up the field with a loss of possession, leads to more ball recoveries in advanced areas, making them more dangerous. But let's get right into it with the Manchester City team. So the first of which I suspect Manchester City will go with two central defenders, two natural central defenders, as that's been their most common function within their structure. Looking at their double pivot, they will create a double pivot in some way, shape, or form, most likely against Chelsea to give them more structure in possession and more control in transition because Chelsea do look dangerous and they have the players to hurt uh, Man City in transition, especially if they go with two natural central defenders, then creating a back three via a rotation or asymmetric movement of some sort. And we're going to be talking a lot about asymmetries in this video because that directly relates to my book, which is out. You can check it out. There's a link below in the description. So we're going to try to be relating these concepts back to the book I wrote. In this first picture, we have our two central defenders being split by the goalkeeper. And now one similarity we'll notice is the staggering of the double pivot and the ability for these players to occupy different vertical and horizontal lines. And now what this does, it creates different situations for the defense to have to defend against. So on one side, we'll see the right central defender most of the time will be Ruben Diaz. He'll then have a mutual help space option, which will look quite like a rondo. So he'll have three passing options, a first, second, and third line passing option, which is a very fundamental way Manchester City look to exploit numerical superiority with players on different lines and maximum diagonal passing options. Whereas on the weak side, the third line passing option will be created a little bit higher up the field and there'll be a lower density or lower numerical occupation of the wide area and the half space, which will then elicit more for a mid-range pass to then beat the press directly, taking advantage of the goalkeeper's range of passing. So now moving into the midfield third, I thought it was really interesting in their FA Cup match. Manchester City did things very differently, but this is crucial when looking at similarities and differences of Chelsea and Man City, because where Manchester City, they have the license to change structure and manipulate the space and the occupation of space to then lead to different routes of progression. Chelsea don't have quite that variability within their team, which may help them in simplifying player roles and being consistent with how they play every game. And maybe it's why they've been so consistent under Thomas Tuchel this season, ever since he took over. But with Manchester City, if they go with a back four, there'll be some key differences. And this might just be situationally, they might line up on paper with a back three, back five. But at some point in the game, Manchester City will look like they have two central defenders 
in every game they rotate through structures and player positionings so it's not uncommon to find them with a back four and then having a three-man first line build-up structure but when they do go with two central defenders and their double pivot it completely changes where the space is and how they look to occupy this space so the first thing is both teams share as principles is the staggering of their first and second line in their build-up shape now the staggering is crucial for the teams and they couldn't grind out results like they have been doing either side all season without this staggering so what i mean by this is that the staggering from the central defenders into the holding midfielders and the fullbacks are on diagonal passing options which puts natural passing lanes between defenders because of this staggering and it makes it harder for them to block these passes with their cover shadow and now we start to see a little bit of symmetry with how they occupy the half space and wide area on either side now it's important to note with each of the central defenders more oriented towards the half space it elicits more of a two-man first line build-up structure and with pressure mounting the double pivot is a way they can secure all possession and with the goalie at a base they always have a fail safe if things go south much like chelsea aren't afraid to use their goalkeeper although they do do it more sparingly sparingly than manchester city but with the two-man first line buildup and the four-man second line buildup manchester city would then look to exploit exploit space in the wider area and another similarity is the occupation of the wide area of these two teams now chelsea do it with wing backs advancing further up the field whereas city more often than not they use single occupation of the wide area unless as we see here they use their fullbacks and they have their wingers enter the wide area but a little bit more narrow always unless as we see here they use their fullbacks the and they have their wingers enter the, 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 the wide area, area. but a little bit more narrow always having one wider than, than the other in the same the defense channel. horizontally where chelsea they go with single width more often than not except when timo Werner pulls into the wide area and they do this to hold their structure to create space for the players in the, the central positions. Now looking at City with a three-man build-up structure, we have our back three and a single pivot now. And this is what we should expect to see more in the Champions League final between the two teams. Three players in the build-up as each team will use because of the security it gives each team in possession and it gives opportunity for more fluid movements higher up the field so as we see here as we've seen Cancelo more often than not this season he's been going in to inverted roles or along the single pivot who's more often than not Rodri and then this allows the attacking midfielders to occupy space higher up the field between the lines and create numerical superiority over teams with a five man midfield structure and the five man comes from the two holding midfielders the two offensive midfielders a little bit wider again creating the diagonality which is a staple in each team's offensive structure and the fifth player will usually be the false nine coming from a higher area as we see here and now we're not talking specifically about players in higher areas but with talking about the similarity of each team going with a back three in possession. Chelsea, they typically go with a three or five man defensive structure out of possession, which will present Pep with the problem of how do we pin these players or do we try and get them to jump to deeper players and exploit the space in behind. So two forwards would pretty typically pin three central defenders but it's all personal preference and how Pep wants to exploit and create space in the first and second line to then progress the ball. So now going back to the FA Cup final where they had the double pivot of Fernandinho and Rodri, we look to see how even though they, they're playing with a clear back four on paper with the personnel and how the game developed, we'll still see the use of a three-man back line in their offensive phase. And this gives them passing options 
from each of the central corridors, both half spaces and the central area. And another key, key similarity is the use of the central corridors, but not only the central corridors, but also the wide area with their back three. So we may even see, whether it's John Stones, Diaz, or Laporte entering just the wide area to then have more space to then take its first touch forward and progress around the Chelsea defensive block, especially because they do defend quite narrow. And whereas in this situation, it's Laporte. Um, Chelsea, it would be Rudiger, and they play very similar roles in possession with their aggressiveness and confidence to drive forward, progressing around the opposing team's defensive block. And on this weak side, Man City, more often than not, will create this back three with an asymmetric back four, seeing Kyle Walker come as the right central defender uh, in the wide area in a deeper position alongside the front three using asymmetry in, term, in terms of horizontal distance between these players. And then a single pivot. As we see, each team will always have a pivot, whether it's a single or a double will vary very much for each team. Another similarity with Jorginho playing the role for Chelsea and Rodri playing this role for City. Both Rodri and Jorginho will pretty much be the main pivot but then we have Conte and Kovacic on Chelsea playing more as an eight, but also occupying the double pivot role in possession, but with license to jump forward into offensive positions. Whereas City, they use more horizontal movements from Cancelo to then enter alongside Rodri or Gundogan coming from a higher area into a deeper area to form this double pivot. So now Chelsea in possession, in the first third, they'll use asymmetry within their goalkeeper, Kepa. Usually Thiago Silva goes to the right of Kepa um, to then overload the right side, which is, as we talked about earlier in the video, is a staple for Manchester City as well. The ability to overload one side, vacate the weak side, and then have different routes of progression depending on the side. And we just start to see the staggering from the double pivot. Jorginho playing deeper, pretty much all the time, connecting play from the first, second, and third line, and stabilizing, consolidating possession as his role, with his qualities of being able to, to handle a high volume of passes and ball retentions played into him. Conte playing through the right half space primarily. He'll pretty much always play through the right half space, and a difference between the double pivot of City and Chelsea is the Chelsea double pivot will play more off-centered, meaning Jorginho will play in the central corridor, and Conte will play more in the half space. And what this does is it gives Conte a little bit less pressure because his technical ability isn't his biggest strength. But with him playing in the half space, it gives him less of a chance to be back-pressed and gives him an easier time with his field of view on where he can look and limiting the amount of options he has, making it good for him because it simplifies his decision-making process. So now Chelsea again, we're looking now in the Premier League match between these two teams, clear back three, a pretty symmetric back three as we'll typically see from Chelsea. But don't, don't be surprised if Rhys James plays in this role and plays it a little bit wider to then be more aggressive with his dribbling progression into past the first and second line of pressure and now the double pivot of Chelsea and we can talk about staggering from both teams as a similarity pretty much playing off-centered from each of the defensive players creating press resistant structures around the Manchester City defensive shape which will be crucial in their match to exploit the third man concepts as we just see here off our screen the fullback of Chelsea and where they can really hurt City is when City press out to in, meaning using their cover shadow to block these passes into the wider areas. Chelsea can use this to exploit a third man concept and create press resistant structures through the central corridors to then find this free, this free player in the wider area. Now with Chelsea, how the first and second line impact the players higher up the 
field will be less intense than how Manchester City's team do it, but they'll pretty much will more, I can more than guarantee each team will use their double pivot at some point in the game and use the occupation to overload the half space, creating a base within the half, half space, the double pivot, staggering themselves to utilize the half space and creating height through the half space. And all these players will be a little bit off-centered to avoid vertical passes, but also changing their height to ask different questions of the Manchester City defense. And where Manchester City have natural wingers that occupy wider areas like Phil Foden often does to then come more narrow, we see the wing backs of Chelsea more often than not will play in the wider areas with more traditional wing backs. Both of them are highlighted here, but sparingly will they come in and make inverted runs. So if we see Aspil Aquita or Reese James, whoever plays this role, he will oftentimes make narrow runs between defenders, which will then free up space for the third line passing option, which we haven't talked about much, but that's the offensive midfielder to come unmarked and preventing a defender of the Manchester City defensive line from jumping and following him, allowing players like Pool, Sid, Ziyech, Timo Werner even, even though his strength isn't with his back to goal. But these players arriving the blind side of the holy midfielders of Manchester City to then have an outlet in possession of the ball. And those are just a few concepts when looking at both of the teams. Similarity, dif difference of time about asymmetry, talking about changes in structure, players' tendencies and how their qualities impact their roles. And it should be an exciting game. I can't wait. And that's the video, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll just take a quick break here. Thank you so much for watching the content at Modern Soccer Coach. If you would like to support what we're doing and help us provide more free coaching education with the webinars and the podcasts and everything else, please take a look at this offer that we have from the webinars over the summer. Coaches can now download every single webinar tactical presentation that we did from the lockdown period over the summer. Just over $1 per webinar, you can personally download all 25 webinars that will be yours to keep. Each webinar is over one hour long and features a detailed presentation followed by live Q&A with the coaches in attendance. We cover topics such as youth and elite player development, sports science, tactical analysis, match preparation, goalkeeper pressing and other key specific areas. We had coaches such as Jesse Marsh, Nolan Sheldon, Ivan Beregi, Adin Osman Basic, Oliver Gage, Jonas Munkfall, Kat Smith, John Wall and many more. ModernSoccerCoach.com slash shop. You can go there, get yours now. Support Modern Soccer Coach. Help us provide free content with our webinars and podcasts throughout the year. Thank you. Fantastic, fantastic. Um yeah, let's let's get stuck in. This is a, a really, really interesting topic. Um, coaches, we, we can take questions coming up. We're going to go into a little bit more rotations. Uh, James using some animations there. Great use of that there. Uh, if I put up some of the keyframe stuff, we did a promotion at the start of it. Keyframe are teaming up with us. Uh, Jimmy uses keyframe to great impact. It can be used yep. as tactical analysis. It can also be used as player feedback. So I'd done a webinar just before Christmas on how I would use a tactical animation system to give feedback to players. Uh, it's no, not available um, on the website, uh, but here is a link for it. So a free link. Uh, if you want to get your own copy of it there, you can go ahead and click on it. So, um, And that's coming from Keyframe. So please check it out. Free trial for all the coaches and definitely recommend you you uh giving it a giving it a look um jimmy that was yeah. fantastic um, so one of the things and i know we're going to go into now rotations but you talk about the flexibility and of these coaches and it is at a, at a high level mm -hmm. on the defensive side we've seen we talk about pressing and we talk about you know triggers when you're changing from system to system and you're analyzing this is there a trend of when they pop into a back three or when they wrote is there a minute is there a, a something in the game or 
Like, how do they do that? Yeah, I don't think that it's a, like a predetermined thing, like at minute 15 or whatnot, they're going to change to a back three. I think it's more situationally because when the game starts, uh, things start to happen and maybe the opponent approaches the game differently than how you prepared for. So a lot of times I notice with Manchester City, a lot of their forming of the back three, whether it's creating more entry passes into their holding midfielders or into their uh, offensive midfielders, it can also be a way to control their transition. So with Kyle Walker playing as the fullback, it's it's super helpful for him to come deeper and join the first uh, line of buildup to then have that uh, cushion almost as the three central defenders and to have stronger circulation. And it has a lot to do with with the distances of passes, the players circulate the ball because if you're passing 15 yards, the ball can change direction very quickly um, from one player to the next. But whereas if you had just two central defenders, maybe it's a 30-yard pass, there's less less opportunity to then um, exploit shorter passes. So you have to wait longer for the player to receive it um, and that sort of thing. So I think it's the players are he trained I, i'm almost positive that in training they go through some situations um how they create space where they look to hurt manchester city and all these all these movements will just be tools to then uh to then carry out their ultimate goals within possession so yeah that's just my little take on it but yeah i, I always laugh when people are like it's not a complicated game but, mm-hmm. it, but at the highest level, it is a complicated game. It has to be because yeah. the level of these players is so high. Mm-hmm. The, the topic of rotations and symmetric and asymmetric, I mean, I, I've, I'm halfway through the book. Uh-huh. I'm really, really enjoying it. But this this uh, symmetric, asymmetric, I know you've got some stuff now to show us about that there. Uh, if you want to pull that up there, like it's... Yep. Talk us through a little bit about that because, yeah, on surface level, it does seem, I'm sure a lot of coaches would be like, whoa, what's, how would I start or where would I put this with my, with my group of players? Okay, yeah, so um, pretty much the idea behind the asymmetric and symmetric rotations is that uh, it all started when, uh, when I first started learning about it and you think uh, uh, really like a Bielsa team, for example, some uh, team that's very movement-oriented, dynamic, um, teams that play in a more uh, man-oriented defensive system, they struggle against this high level of movement because of the fitness required, but um, when a team's more spatially oriented in their defensive phase and a team is rotating a lot and just for the sake of rotating, um, typically... A more spatially oriented defense can handle that very well because they control the space they control and whether the play it it doesn't make too much more of a difference so then this idea of of asymmetric and symmetric um, rotation I kind of thought of to to make it more specific and give it more context so asymmetric is more you're changing the structure of the players involved or the whole team to then better solve the problems of the defense. Um, So that's when we start to see inverted fullbacks and then uh, asymmetric movement from the weak side coming to create a back three, whereas symmetric, it's more you're keeping the same structure within the team, but now it's just about getting new players in these different roles. Um, So if that makes sense. So it's about bringing the different qualities of each player. All right, so yeah, it's about the symmetric is more about bringing different qualities to the same roles your team already has. Asymmetric is about creating whole new roles to then uh, solve the problems the defense presents you. So that's the main idea, the asymmetric, symmetric. And then how we go into the book and we talk about it, I like to isolate the variables, meaning the ball, the space, the opponents, and then the teammates. So we have our Chelsea setup, and then we have Timo Werner, highest up the field, Mason Mount playing through the left half space, and Chilwell holding the width. And so now an asymmetric, or a symmetric movement, sorry, would then show these players interchanging through these three positions. So there'll always be width, always will be a player 
in the advanced half space and then always someone pinning the back line or creating height within the team structure. So oftentimes we see Mason Mount, he's flexible. His abilities 1v1 allows him to pull into the wide area. Ben Chilwell, with his directness at times, he can then make higher runs up the field to pin the back line and team over runner checking back towards the ball to then maintain the structure. So it's about these three positions and the players moving dynamically to create space and then use their qualities in different ways. Whereas Manchester City, we have our three zones here just off the players. So Mara is creating height, height and single width. Uh, Bernardo Silva playing as more of the advanced midfielder and then Kyle Walker as the deep line playmaker and with a traditional rotation we'll see a midfielder coming just outside of the central defenders creating a back three which could release Walker into the high, higher area in the wide area still and then Mara is coming between the lines. So it's really about moving these players into new roles but keeping the structure consistent. And now with the asymmetric movement here, the structure changes and it presents new problems for the defense um, to try and deal with. And it gives new opportunity with the team in possession by creating new roles for players to, to then move into. So if we're looking at the diagrams, we have Stones and Diaz in possession of the ball. We'll have Kyle Walker drop deeper. Rodri move over to make space for Cancelo, the inverted fullback, and we'll end with a 3-2 three, three, build-up structure. And now with the Chelsea team, a lot of times at some stages in the match, they'll look to create the third-line passing option to take away um, the defenders and initiate a third-man movement, which would come from Werner dropping deeper into the central area and Mason Mount, Ziyech, or Pulisic, whoever plays in this role, they'll go higher to then pin the back four and allow Timo Werner to then go unmarked. So those are two uh, pretty consistent uh, rotations each team uses within each game. At some point, uh, we'll, we'll expect to see those. So here I'm just identifying the team structure with the back four, the four players at the base in the midfield, and then the players creating the height and width of the wingers, Foden and Mares. So then their movement allows Cancelo to become an inverted fullback, joining Rodri, and then creating a back three with Kyle Walker more oriented towards the wide area to create space against the Chelsea defensive block. The symmetric rotation maintaining the structure of a deep player, single width creating height, and a player between the lines in an advanced area. So now Moving over to Chelsea in possession, we'll have our back three, which is a staple for the Chelsea side. Our double pivot, a little bit off-centered, and our two offensive midfielders through the half space with our three attacking players. Uh, Werner being joined by the wingbacks. Timo Werner, as we just talked about, coming deeper, initiating the third man movement, and Mount and Ziyech moving higher up the field to pin the back four. And then the symmetric rotation, Mount coming wide, Timo Werner dropping deeper, and Ben Chilwell making the advanced run to then pin the back line. So now, here a little bit back to the point of why we isolate the variables, because um, then we can perceive movement at its foundation, understand the movement from how the player will interact with it, and then it will allow us to create better cues um, in which a team can carry out the goals within possession of the team. So let's go back, see if Gary joined us. Back Perfect. On. Yeah, back on. Yeah, I uh, just finished up the last slide. So Brilliant, brilliant. Um, I put on Jimmy's uh, the book, the new book I just said earlier. I'm happy to do it, absolutely loving it. So coaches, please check out uh, the link on the right side uh, and and get yourself a copy of it and go through it. Absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, coaches, if you want to put some questions up, again, uh, we'll do some promotions to the side. Please check out Keyframe. Make sure you check out, get take advantage of that free trial. Jimmy, um, yep. you're a young player. 
if you were to take a group now and say high school club level of 14 to 16 year old players what where would you start with the rotations where would you start with that style how would you start implementing it what would be your first steps yeah well first i think it would be identifying the qualities of my players and in relation to what's around in the league. Um, so identifying things we could excel at and then finding a, a system that would fit. But I, I would start with the principles and try and get across that and first make sure everyone understands the principles. So if our main principle was using possession as a tool to progress the ball and make sure they know that that would be our identity. Or if we were a team that would play direct, uh, win the second balls, um, so, but pretty clear, I'd have uh, principles, defensive, offensive, and then slowly incorporate the transitions because those can be a little more volatile. But then as we progress as a team, I would give them more tools and more rotations depending on how the players grow, grow within the system, um, ways they can carry out the, the principles that we set as a team. So if you have certain players who who have certain qualities that can play multiple roles, finding a way to incorporate that so that during the course of a game, we can uh, have different options to try and hurt the other team or protect our, our own goal. So. Brilliant. Um, I'll get to, we've got coaches questions starting to come in now. Coaches, please put them on. It's the last last 20 minutes now. We'll, we'll start to take some questions. So if coaches want to, want to start putting them on the chat room, feel free. Uh, the last one for me is then alongside that, Jimmy, you hear a lot of coaches that'll see that, you know, they're geniuses, really. Uh, these two mm -hmm. coaches, they're absolute geniuses in their work. A lot of people, cynics will say, well, hey, it's just about the players. If I don't have those players, if I had those players, I would do those. Stuff. <laughs> well, most of us don't have, you know, uh, World Cup winners and European Championship and Champions yeah. League and all that there. So, is that an excuse to be to be trying these things, or, or would you challenge coaches to be putting and implementing and trying? Uh, I think it would depend on the level and how much pressure there is to win. Um, but I think going through the American youth system, played academy, played uh, high school, then played through college, the college system. Um, I, I I think when I was at my most in, enjoyment and I progressed the most is when there was clear ideas. I knew exactly what the coach wanted. He had a clear system. And even if as a player who didn't fit that system, there would still be room for development. And then you can really isolate the skills that you need to be good at. And then that allows you to, to flourish. So I think it's not like, of course, these are the best players in the world, um, the best coaches, which, which goes without saying. But I still think there's a lot of room for improvement with having clear and concise feedback and on what everybody expects and then the things you need to be good at to flourish. Um, so yeah, that that's what I would probably say to that. Good answer, good answer. Like an experienced coach. <laughs> all right, so um, all great. Some great questions coming in now. So uh, Yigit has asked about Chelsea's center backs look bad during mm. Lampard's time there. Well, I think Tuchel's 3-4-3 three, three, gives freedom, left and right center backs and shows their strengths. Rudiger is the best example of that. Do you agree, disagree? Is what, How is he getting more out of them than Lampard did? Yeah, I think the three, because we see Asbil Koita often playing as right center back, Thiago Silva playing as the most central defender. Um, both are a bit older, so in isolation they could, they could struggle a little bit. So I think it does give them a little more cover in behind and the experienced guys playing with three central defenders can oftentimes be harder to organize with the distances and the offsides line because you have just one extra player to then you have to organize and be in line with but I think the experience it helps them they they can better use their experience with the cover they have in the three central defenders so yeah I would say the system has to do a lot with it but I, I also know that Tuchel, I read somewhere, he has his central defenders hold tennis balls in some training sessions, so they're not grabbing forwards and giving away penalty kicks and that sort of thing. So I think there was a little more attention to detail with Tuchel as well. Oh, so. I'd imagine the detail at that level is just unbelievable. Um, yeah. 
Christy Holly from downstairs has uh, has come up here, so I got to get him before he yells at me. I'm going to go back down. Uh, do you think that when a team relies upon central rotations, it can leave them exposed in transitional moments? So central rotations, meaning players coming into the central corridors, like the central midfielders. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that's an interesting point because off, oftentimes when you lose possession in the midst of a transition, players are, are kind of unclear of their roles. And the transition phases, they all are often just more volatile because of the fast, um, quick decisions. So I think it would, it would have to be why, why is your team rotating? What's the goals of the rotation? And then it carries in how well is your offensive organization phase? How well is that linked to prepare for the transition? So I think that's like a, another level of thinking here and coaching on that when your players lose the ball, how is the system set up to facilitate a positive transition defensively and offensively? Because they're all connected. And I don't think you can talk about one or plan as a coach for one without having an idea like when we lose the ball, how are we going to be able to transition to win it back as fast as possible or structure ourselves to then block off key areas for uh, for the opponent who had just won the ball. So, yeah, so I think centrally, I find te teams are better suited when they bring more players into the central areas because you're exposed through the width, but when you go through the wide areas, you have to go away from goal first to then go back towards the center to then attack the goal. So, so typically, I feel more comfortable with when teams leave the wide areas more vacated than um, leaving the centers centers a little bit more open with space. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say, say about that. Very good, very good. Uh, Yerem has asked, if you were to coach symmetric rotations, what constraints would you use or how would you coach it? Oh, that's interesting. So it again goes back to the players you have. So what what would these players' qualities be? Um, what would they bring to the roles and how they would change? So uh, a good example of players' roles and players playing the same position but completely differently is when Danilo played for Manchester City. When Danilo would invert, he was more there for defensive cover to um, put him closer to the outlets to then have a better press when they lost it. Um, whereas now we see Cancelo, when he inverts, it's for offensive reasons primarily, even though he is good in transition. But Danilo, he wasn't one to get on the ball and, and dictate play, where Cancelo is more, um, more comfortable in possession in tighter areas. So I think it would be finding the role, but also finding a way for the player to flourish in their role. So it could be uh, a matter of if you believe you should work on your strengths and make them better than anyone or work on your weaknesses um, to then get them better. So, so yeah, I think it would be very player to player um, on how extreme their weaknesses and strengths were, the disparity between the two. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, last two questions. Coaches, last call for questions. Uh, again, I will put Jimmy's book up and the link up as well before we shoot off as well if you've enjoyed this I know getting people like Jimmy to come on and present and keeping these webinars free is a big big part of of, um, of modern soccer coach and trying to make it as affordable for coach education around the world so if you want to support us and, and you have a couple of dollars pounds euros in your pocket First of all, buy a copy of Jimmy's book because we told him we'd plug it and it'd be worth his time going on here. <laughs> Second of all, uh, we put the webinar link up as well. If you want to buy uh, the 2020 webinars with, with people like Jesse Marsh and Adina Osman Basic, uh, and then just give it a shout out on social media. Uh, that's all we ask. Uh, so uh, really appreciate Jimmy coming on. And like I said, this this area of rotation, flexibility and attack, I think is the probably the next layer of, of football i would say over the next 10 15 years this flexibility um very very interesting how to coach it and how we move it and how we be a bit more flexible in our environments um you mentioned earlier about uh, a couple of coaches are asking this i mean what what are the steps to coach i know you say it depends on the players but mm -hmm. if, if you are say jimmy in a college environment and you have 20 games i know you've played in this system and 
Sometimes it's a hot topic. There's not enough tactics. There's not enough time on the pitch to yeah. get up and going. What's your thoughts there? Yeah, I think video. Nothing. Nothing beats a video session with, with first the uh, two-dimensional diagrams on tactical board, or if you just have the magnets, um, setting up realistic situations so players can kind of identify what they're supposed to do on paper. Then seeing examples of a, a practice, a inner squad scrimmage, or in a game. So they're, they're seeing it, theoretically they're seeing it, they know what to do, then they're seeing other players do it or themselves do it or what they could do better. And it, it's just about giving them context and giving them the tools to, to help them learn. Um, and I think once once you know what to do visually, you know, then it makes it easier to apply on a game. So it, it might not even be as much on the field as, as much as that helps, but the players, I mean, especially in the college system, the time is valuable. Um, and field space it may not be available. So first, making sure players understand it on a, on a basic level, then they can kind of get into applying it on the field and taking it a step further. Um, but it, it will definitely be a learning curve for sure for players. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine that at every level, Jimmy, right? Like this isn't mm -hmm. something that even if you've got full-time access to your players, this is something that takes a lot of time and a lot of work around the sessions what you're saying there yeah. like analysis is not just the feedback for these players yeah in yeah. And, yeah and it's a it's a big concept of player-led leadership on the field too because the coach isn't going to be saying do this do that on a, a simple level you could say okay we identify the team plays in a 4-4-2 we can create the numerical advantage by dropping a holding midfielder between central defenders. Now we have our three, um, and then to create the double pivot, maybe our fullback or uh, attacking midfielder drops in. So then we have our three, two, to then have more passing options to break the first line of pressure, but still having the stability. So there could be basic cues like that, just to work out the numerical aspect of the game, but then the movement to then further kind of break teams down and develop would, would just be a whole nother level. Brilliant. Brilliant. All right, last two for you. Uh, two little easy ones. What's the difference between Chus and Jorginho, Kante and Kovacic? Well, I mean, yeah, you said this was an easy one. But uh, I think Jorginho, he he probably has to play um, just because he, he, he is really good at at being the pivot, pretty much handling a high volume of passes into him. Um, whereas Conte and Kovacic are more box to box players. Uh, even though Jorginho is a little bit of a liability defensively when he gets isolated, but then with Conte being able to cover ground, um, press, and go further up the field, I think I would go with Jorginho and Conte as just because what Conte is good at. He, he's the best in the world at covering ground, pressing, uh, winning ball recoveries up the field in the final third. So, Brilliant. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Okay, score prediction. Uh, I'm going to go with 2-0 City. Oh, we put a thing up, uh, who was going to win, little poll halfway through yeah. this, and it was heavy on the City side. Chelsea, yeah. no chance? I, well, I, I think... I want to say Chelsea, but I think City is just too good. And Pep, he's lost to Tuchel twice already, so he'll have learned enough about it. And Chelsea, they, they're they set in their ways with their structure. They're developing a little bit. But, but yeah, but people say it's hard to beat a team three times. But, I mean, if I'm Chelsea, I would have rather beat City twice going into the final than maybe have a one game apiece or lost twice just because the momentum will more so be on Chelsea's side especially if they get a few positive results. But City having clinched the league uh, a couple games back, you will have rested players. Everybody will be fit, ready to go. So, yeah, that's why I say City. Yeah, we've got City 3-0. Mohamed saying, you get saying, we'll soon see extra time. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, I hope so. Yeah, it'll be a great game. I'm sure it'll be yeah. a great game. But, um, Jimmy, thank you so much. Uh, for hey, thanks for having me. Oh, it's been fantastic. I could sit here all day and just go into... Maybe we'll we'll knock out a round two and we'll get some other coaches to take a look at. Um, yeah. Coaches, thanks for joining us. Before you leave, 
two favors. Number one, uh, that off that order form there beside Jimmy's book uh, were rotations. Like I said uh, before, I'm halfway through it. Uh, going down this road, it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So please go ahead, get yourself a copy of Rotations. You will love it. And then the other thing is, if you enjoy the webinar, which I'm sure you did, please just give it a shout out on social media. Just helps Jimmy's work and helps what we're doing as well at Modern Soccer Coach. So, Jimmy, thank you. We we thank love you. having you, and we'll get you on again. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Brilliant. Thanks, Jimmy. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.